Hey, Bartas. Hello. Hey, Max. Hi, Andrew. So, uh, thank you for uh, for uh, the you know for 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 uh, telling everything about the Bartas talk already. But, anyways, uh, when I uh, when I read the description, I thought that this talk would be about uh, Aka.net or about F Sharp because Bartas is an uh, F Sharp consultant and. Uh, Aka.net contributor, but actually no, it has nothing to do with F# -sharp or Aka.net specifically. It's rather about uh, multi-threading in general, not only about .NET platform, but about some different kind of technologies. But at the same time, we'll we'll review some implementation details of uh, .NET specific things. So I'm eager to um, to listen for this talk. Bartosz, shall we start? Yeah, we can start. Perfect. Okay, so as mentioned, this the title of this talk is Behind Model Concurrence Primitives. Uh, my name is Bartosz Sepetkowski. And in a second, you should be able to see the next slide. Yeah, so there you have a necessary contact information in case if you wanted to talk with me about anything really after the after the talk you have also a link to my blog post when i often come up with uh, some topics like the one that we will be covering today so what is the agenda of this talk so we'll be talking about something that is more often known as green threads in .NET, we call them tasks, but the idea behind them is wider, I would say. So we'll be covering uh, thread equivalents that are existing in user space, in runtimes, in libraries uh, that we are using on everyday basis. This talk won't be covering only .NET though. We'll be also taking a look at the glossary of different techniques that are used and different trade-offs that are applied by different platforms like Go, Erlang, and F Sharp Async, how it differs from example, for example, from Task Parallel Library and stuff like that. And what are the common what is the common grounds of the uh, common ground of them all? And how do they differ? We'll cover thread pools because, well, pretty much all of the modern soft, modern multi-threaded software uses thread pools as a, I would say, basic foundation of their design. We'll also talk about a little bit about schedulers, coroutines, which are those user space threads. I choose the name coroutines, but you can think about task promises. Asyncs, there are multiple names for those. And uh, last but not least, we'll cover a mechanism of state machines. Here, specifically, mechanism of uh, .NET, .NET async state machines that are under underlying work behind async await. So let's start with the question. Why have we used code that is async await instead of using plain old ordinary thread API. This thread API exists basically from day one in .NET. However, we are not used to use it nowadays, right? And let's ask ourselves why really? Well, some people would say that it's about speed, but this is not, not really true. In many cases, using you know ordinary synchronous threads can be even faster than using async. But the issue is, we're not looking at the speed here. We're looking after something else, really. So there are several reasons behind tasks and using async await. Uh, we'll cover only two of them here, as I think those are actually the most crucial one. One of them is that threads, .NET threads, are backed by the underlying O operating system API, so operating system threads. And, well, 
some from from time to time when we have multiple threads we need to switch the execution between one and another the thing is that this execution switch uh, exec, uh, context switch sorry because this is the correct name this context switch might be quite expensive because operating system needs to basically snapshot the state of the world at the moment when the when it's about to change the threat of execution. So it needs to check out and store the state of the registers, stuff like that, before switching to another thread and restoring its own state into the registers and, store, and so on. So those context switches might be quite expensive. Also because we are passing through kernel space, which also applies some several extra operations that operating system needs to provide to make all of those operations safe, right? But in the, in the case of tasks, well, tasks don't really care so much about the um, registers, about the stack itself. And instead, they are heap allocated objects in, in .NET at least. And they are storing all of the necessary state related to specific con execution context of given task as a fields uh, of the underlying object that you know is backed by the task. So this is much simpler to operate on. Another issue, even more important, is a scalability. This is the real reason why we are using tasks. Because in .NET, each time we are allocating a thread, a .NET is creating a fixed size stack of that for that thread. And this fixed size stack, for example, has one megabyte of size. It doesn't matter if we are using all of it or not, it will always be this one megabyte. Our, as we are configured, we have configured it in .NET. On old ISS, it was the default was changed to a quarter of that, so 256 kilobytes. But well, who uses an ISS these days, right? So we we could only spawn a very limited amount of threads because before we are running out of the available memory, available resources. Compared to that. The task itself as an object, it only weighs around 72 bytes. And if we put onto it all the allocations that are needed to, for example, schedule it on the thread on the thread pool and stuff like that, this goes somewhere around 300 bytes, but those numbers are not fixed and they are changing as you know the new .NET runtime uh, is improving. And probably at this point in time, this could be significantly less. So the, re the way how the task works that you can already observe here is that tasks are executed by scheduler on top of something that we call thread pool. Thread pool is a wide concept, but in the case of .NET, uh, we are talking about global thread pool that, well, is basically underlying all of the the, all of those um, task management stuff, we usually cannot change it or most of the time when we are doing day-to-day -day work, we also don't care about it because it's something that works explicitly. The reason why we have this distinguish, uh, we are distinguishing scheduler and thread pool is that thread pool only executes uh, synchronous actions and tasks quite often are backed by some kind of continuous logic like async await when you know we are awaiting different tasks and want to bind the result of previous execution to the next step and so on and so on and those execution steps are splitted and uh, basically scheduled by scheduler itself so we'll talk about it later but first let's cover what the thread pool really is and how it's built underneath Okay, so the basic idea is that we have a piece of hardware that usually consists in modern day in hardware, please. it consists of multiple CPUs, right? So multiple cores that are available for our execution. On top of that, our thread pool uh, creates an, on top of our, that, our thread pool creates an agent. Agent is basically a managed thread with some specific logic that 
this agent or worker uh, is basically backed by some kind of job queue. So we don't access it directly. Instead, we are scheduling our jobs on top of those uh, queues. And later on, those agents are picking up the data, uh, the jobs from the queues and executing them on the CPUs they are assigned, of, assigned to. Uh, because we already talked about context switching in .NET, uh, you know that ideally we would like to avoid context switches, at least on the OS level. For this reason, we usually try to keep the number of those managed threads, those workers uh, managed by the thread pool itself, more or less aligned to the number of CPU cores, because this provides the least, least, least amount of context switches and the best execution. So this is very naive thread pool. We can also do even more. We can basically pin our threads to specific CPU cores. And .NET also makes it available. You can see here that we can also see how many threads are executing on the current .NET process. In case of this code running on my machine, I have four core, I had four cores and 10 threads. And the reason why those numbers are not equal is because .NET itself has also several different threads running in the background that we are usually not aware of. And those are related to things, for example, like I operations or for example, GC, garbage collector threads. And the thing is that we can set up a preferred thread where this, uh, uh, sorry, preferred core uh, when where this thread is to be executed or even strictly require a specific core to be responsible for uh, executing the code running by this thread. This is not always uh, possible from what I read. iOS doesn't uh, expose this, that kind of options, but okay. Why would we want to pin the threads to specific, uh, specific computer cores, right? The answer here is on this uh, image. So basically what how the hardware architecture works is that we have those CPU cores, right? And each CPU cores has cache. Cache on modern hardware, sorry, uh, there is a mystic in this diagram. Uh, we have L1, L2, and L3 cache, and then we have the RAM. The thing is that access to memory in L1 and L2 is very fast at the price of those L1 and L2 caches being local to each specific CPU core. And usually it works more or less like that, that when we are tr trying to execute some data, we are reading it from RAM and caching it in those uh, L caches. And if we are about to, for example, somewhere in the nearby future, right? We want to access the same data again. We don't need to read it from RAM if we already have it in our L cache, L1 or L2 cache. So if it's already there, we don't need to reach for it. And this make those makes those operations a lot faster. And for this reason, oh, and for this reason, uh, we want to execute the same kind of operation or the same kind of operation working on the same data on the same core as often as possible to you know, avoid those uh, memory calls. And what is important here, what I didn't include, is that if you have the code to be executed, right? So in computer instruction, machine instructions, they are also represented as data from the hardware perspective, right? Because this machine code needs to be stored somewhere and loaded somewhere. So it's also cached on the CPU cores. This is why I told we want to have as many as and the same data executing the same operations on the same core as often as possible. And the thing is even more important when we are talking about NUMA architecture. So when we have massive number of cores, because as the number of cores grows, we are no longer able to you know, pick them. We are no longer physically able to stick them so close to each other to 
share, for example, uh, L3 caches or cache lines. So for these reasons, uh, they need to communicate with each other in buses, so-called buses, and they are grouped together in some co in so-called NUMA groups. So for example, you can have 64 cores, but um, each of the NUMA groups only can have up, for example, eight of them, right? And those eight uh, cores will communicate with each other faster because they are physically closer to each other on the actual hardware, physical hardware. So this was an issue when we were talking about this uh, previous threadful implementation, because we had a single job queue. And this single job queue was our bottleneck. Uh, and this is something that is executed. And this actual architecture that you can see here is uh, more or less simplified version of what actually happens on the modern thread pools because uh, thread pool where every single thread worker is accessing the same single uh, job queue is I would say all design patterns because those job queues are as I said bottlenecks here every worker thread has its own dedicated uh, job queue so instead of accessing you know this single bottleneck and um, every single worker thread can just access its own uh, job queue. And nice thing here is that those job queues can possibly be cached on our L1 to L3 caches. And for this reason, access is much more, it's much faster also because we don't have to introduce any kind of synchronization mechanism like logs to get access to that job queue. So let's talk about work stealing because you can imagine that the amount of pressure of jobs queued on each of the workers queue might differ, right? Because we haven't said that those worker threads will uh, schedule and execute those jobs in the same amount of time or that the items will be split evenly uh, over every job queue. So we might run into some pathological situation when one thread is, has basically an empty, um, empty queue while other workers are still full and working on 100%. This is not an optimal usage of computer resources, right? So in order to avoid that, usually we introduce something that is called work stealing. And this works as in many libraries, user space libraries, for example, in .NET, uh, as well as on operating system level, because this architecture also under, uh, underlines actual scheduler working on the operating system. So instead of jobs, we have operating system threads and the whole idea works in very similar fashion. So how works thing works? Well, whenever our worker, our agent uh, finishes its job, its last job and sees that his, his queue is empty. He is basically looking at the queue of it, his neighbor, neighbor and picking up the pending job from here. And this way we can guarantee that all of the cores will be, exec uh, will be executing all the time whenever there's any kind of work to do, right? So it was easy. But there is also something that, for example, doesn't really exist in .NET per se, I would say. So there is this idea called uh, affinity. So whenever we have different jobs working over the same piece of state, for example, the same class, the same object, why not put them on the same queue all the time? In this case, we are giving up this works in capabilities. But what we are gaining is that this state, if it was cached on those cache line, cache, uh, caches of the specific cores, it's, it will no longer be affected by works in. So it will no longer be copied between uh, L cache of one core to L cache of another one. And this way, we are about to 
basically save the computation time necessary for this copying mechanism to work. The, of course, the issue here is that without work stealing, we would have to basically say that we are in the charge of guaranteeing that the work is split evenly among the workers. Sometimes it's possible, sometimes it's not, but what kind of advantage, advantage does it give us? Well, this was introduced in ACCA, not ACCA.net, but on ACCA JVM some time ago. And what they noticed by changing this approach to give up the work stealing into something like affinity based threadful. Uh, and they noticed that this gave them around 30 percent uh, more performance when running their exemplar scenarios. So 30% turns out to be quite a lot for a simple change like that. Of course, being aware that this is this is a trade-off, one of the trade-offs that we will be talking about. And well, why doesn't why we don't use it in .NET by default, just as we told .NET uh, generic .NET thread pool cannot assume any kind of guarantees about how the task will be split or processed, right? Because it doesn't know what kind of program we are running on it. It must work okay in every case. And for this reason, it's usually better to use a uh, works in thread pool than affinity-based one. However, this affinity-based uh, approach also is underlying something that is called thread for core architecture and some of systems like for example Scylla DB uh, or actually Sister, the framework that underpins Scylla DB uh, is using. So for those of you who don't know Scylla DB, it's basically a Cassandra equivalent uh, written in pure C++ and they are claiming to achieve around 10 times more better performance than Cassandra. So it's quite a lot. It's uh, basically a result of many different trade-offs, but since they are building the database, they can control a whole environment this way. And this is also one of the architectural decisions they took. So 30% here, 10 times there. If you are knowing what you are doing, then maybe, just maybe, it's something for you. But what we haven't, well, another thing that we haven't talked about is how to work with IO, because there is a problem with IO. And this problem is that on Linux, for example, uh, many, uh, many IO methods are blocking, and they are not blocking only a specific task, but also underlying thread. So if we will take a look at this following code, here we are about to process several files. We want to process them in parallel. So we basically spawn a new task for each of the files and then use task when all to wait for all uh, of those uh, processors to complete, right? So, well, it looks, I would say sensibly, but there is uh, one issue. So. The issue here is that we called a, ta a reader read to end, which is a synchronous call. In this case, it means that we basically are stopping our execution uh, of the current thread up to the moment when the, the reader ends his work. Now, why is it a problem? The problem here is that we have limited number of uh, threads working on our thread, right? they are shared among the tasks. Let's say we have thread pool with four threads. So and the way how this one will work is that we will first execute four tasks blocking the entire thread pool. Then once they will complete, we'll execute another task blocking thread pool again and again. We'll not, not only not use, utilizing the capabilities of our thread pool, but also effectively stopping it from executing other operations that might be used by the other parts of our applications. So we would like to use async IO, so those asynchronous methods. 
But the thing is that it's not always possible. Mm, we, one of the reasons is that we have, for example, things like the Linux API that is might be potentially used by underlying .NET framework, and this Linux API is synchronous. On the Windows, from what I know, the entire .NET Core is using asynchronous uh, asynchronous I/O, which is directly based on the asynchronous I/O of operating system. In this case, Windows. In future, possibly thanks to new development uh, li uh, APIs like IRU Ring, for example, it will be also possible on Linux. But at the case of .NET 5.0. From what I know, it's still not uh, IO hearing based. There is also another reason because not always we will be able to use those IO operations that could be made asynchronous. For example, if you have ever worked with memory mapped files, you will know that what they basically do is that they are abstracting IO access for you from your sorry. So you will never, trying to read a memory mapped file, you will never know really if it's mapped in memory or does it have to be fetched from the disk first. In this case, it's pretty much impossible to make it as in sequence and I'm not, I'm guessing it won't be anytime soon. So what can we do? So the idea here is that aside of having those uh, thread pools, with worker threads pinned to the CPUs, we will also have another pool of threads that are dedicated to handling I access. So the idea is that if you have a kind, some kind of a job that requires an I access, we are basically sending it to be executed onto those IO threads. Those IO threads will be blocked, but this is not so important for us because our threads that are consisting this thread uh, into this thread pool of threads pinning pinned by CPU cores will still be available. So those background IO threads will execute their job and execute the code. They will be blocked, but this is uh, not blocking the rest of our application. And when they are finishing, they will schedule job with completed result on top of uh, the queue itself again. Well, there is also another way to do that. And this is something that actually Go, as a Go language, did. And how the Go routine calls. So basically in Go, what we are doing, uh, Go also has this kind of thread pool with multiple queues. But when the Go routine is about to do a syscall, so something that can potentially block uh, go in, uh, in the underlying thread. It, this entire thread is being parked aside, and the new thread is bound on the worker agent. So this way we can, of course, uh, stack many, many threads working aside. But I think this is something that Go developers just need to be aware of. And this doesn't happen often in real life, from what I know. So this is another way. Now let's talk about schedulers, because given that we have these thread pools, we can go forward. And there are really two types of schedulers. Uh, we distinguish the preemptive ones and cooperative ones. So the difference is that in preemptive preempt scheduler can finish the work of the underlying um, of the underlying uh, task, core routine, go routine, before uh, the task itself gives a control back to the scheduler. On the cooperative variant, the task needs to explicitly say that it finished its piece of job, its piece of work, before giving the control back to the scheduler. So this is the real wartime story from one of uh, the project I was involved in, and this one was using the Node.js. So we had an Excel generation, right? So we basically get some kind of valuations from the database and then insert them as a row into the Excel spreadsheets. Now, what we noticed is that sometimes we have spike uh, latency spikes in our 
Node.js application and now Node.js endpoint, those latency spike, spikes could take up to 10 seconds. And well, it's kind of a lot, right? And after some profiling, we figured out that this method, this actual method was the reason for, uh, reason for that. So why does it happen? Well, it doesn't look really bad here. We are using a aways, we have async await, right? But the thing is that we noticed that the Excel library that we are using, it took it around 500 microseconds to add a single row. And it doesn't sound bad, it doesn't, well, bubble up in the test, but in production, those valuations could have up to 20,000 items and 20,000 times 500 microseconds has up to 10 seconds. Now, why did Node even look, didn't really do anything with that, right? Why we had to intervene here? So the problem is that, as you can see, this loop takes 10 seconds and there is no await inside. And since Node.js is using a cooperative scheduler, it cannot intervene by itself. It cannot preempt currently executing code without being told so. So if there is no awaits inside of this, uh, this for loop, it will never be able to, um, you know, be in this kind of job will never be able to be scheduled back onto the dot, uh, onto the Node.js event loop. So this is, and the similar issue could happen in .NET as well. Of course, we mind that Node.js is using a single threaded event loop per process. And in .NET, we have multiple working threads, but if you will call this method several times, all on the same machine, then this uh, issue will repeat. And now, since this is the CPU-oriented issue, uh, we need to understand how to work with long-running tasks, tasks that will potentially never uh, return the control back to the scheduler in time, in, at least in the latencies, with the latencies that we expect. So we have this scheduler concept, and in .NET we have the nice API that is designed specifically to something like that. It's called uh, task factory start new and the creation option is long running. Long running means that this task can potentially work for quite a while and it will not return the control via await, for example, uh, to the thread pool anytime soon. So what .NET uh, thread pool will do for that or actually .NET scheduler will do, it will schedule a new thread and it will put this task over there. Of course, the issue here is that right now we spawned more tasks that we have CPUs, so we involve the context switches on the OS thread level. But the thing is that OS threads are preempted. So OS threads will always be able to you know, intervene when the current task is taking too long, take out the CPU resources that are used to executing that uh, thread, and put them back onto the rest of the thread pool. And this way, we can still maintain our programs in re response manner. The issue with uh, this uh, thread uh, creation, uh, sorry, task creation option long running is that if there is actually some await inside the task that we scheduled as a long running, it can slip away from this dedicated thread back onto the uh, job queue. So beware of that, that the task that you created with this option might not specifically be executing for its entire lifetime on this managed thread that was dedicated for it. For it. So we can also have a workaround for this. So what I propose here is that every 100 uh, items processed, we are introducing an await step this await step basically is using set timeout with zero. And in Node.js, set timeout zero means that 
we are taking the next piece, uh, the next step. So the next uh, piece of the code between one await and the second one, uh, second one or end of a function, and schedule this piece of state on top uh, and piece of code on top of uh, job queue that is used by the event loop. So this way we introduce the interruption point inside of this uh, for function. And it will give ability for a Node.js event loop to intervene in the case when this code is taking too long, thanks to this await park function call. So this was cooperative schedule. Let's talk about preemptive form. And we already mentioned that uh, all operating systems are, pre uh, are using preemptive schedulers for their own threads, but we also have some of the user space uh, runtimes that are using similar approach. We could, I would say we could uh, define two of those uh, variants. One is step-based, one is time-based. And for the step-based preemption, this is the piece of Erlang code. If you are not familiar with it, Erlang is a uh, runtime and programming language that is this actor model for programming and it has preemptive schedule and how does it work really well in Erlang, we when we are calling a uh, defining a function Erlang really injects a check in there so basically Erlang has a dedicated register that keeps a counter of how many functions were called before intervening. And I've made a pseudocode here to keep those reductions as a, as a parameter, but in fact, what they are doing inside, this is a uh, value stored in register for performance reasons. So basically, whenever we are calling the new function in Erlang, the first what uh, the runtime does is check if this reduction counter didn't hit zero. It ba it's basically 2000 uh, when the new actor is started. So when it hits zero, our uh, schedule is intervening and basically taking the control out of the current function execution and giving it back to the scheduler to schedule the next function to be executed. So you might ask what if the function is taking really really long right all right like in the previous example we have the issue was not with the function set it was about this very long uh, loop executed uh, inside of it well the Erlang programmers uh, take a very pragmatic approach i would say for that in Erlang, you have no for loops there are no loops mechanism in Erlang at all really all if you need to repeat something or iterate over something, in Erlang, you are just doing a tail recursion. So it works more or less like the for loop, but it's underpinned by this function uh, execution, function compilation process. So uh, whenever you are doing recursive call, which would uh, be equivalent of loop step, we are doing this check as well. So this is one way. And yeah, I think, wait, yeah. And in terms of Golang, Golang has a very similar approach, except in Golang uh, it is uh, time-based. So basically we have 50 milliseconds, I think it's, it's 10 or 50 milliseconds of time that a go routine is able to be executed. And um, it's also putting in interruption points into, into uh, beginning of the function calls. And there is also a special kind of go routine that uh, you don't need to instantiate. It's basically created by the runtime, which is basically tracking the execution time of all of running go routines other go routines and if it checks that the go routine is executing for longer than this time window than this round it was allowed to it's basically triggering in and removing this go routine from being executed any longer and giving the control back to the scheduler so it's more time based uh, in the past it was also step based but there was issue and there were issues 
in the Go runtime itself when they were injecting those interruption points into the loops, which were degrading the performance of Go programs. So they changed that in the latest versions into this Go routine working in the background and checking when it's time to intervene. So as we mentioned, there are preemptive and cooperative schedulers. Preemptive are OS threads, Go routines, Erlang processes. Cooperative are most wider, uh, much wider in their popularity, simply because you can create your own uh, scheduler as a library while creating something like grant mechanism needs to be baked into the runtime on the, or the compiler itself. For this reason, cooperative schedulers are much more popular nowadays. And we're going to coroutines or those user space threads. The next, I would say, checklist in our glossary would be splitting them into two variants, eager and lazy. And let's use the following example. This is on the left, you have the code ranking, uh, code uh, written in C sharp. On the right one, you have its equivalent written in F sharp. On C sharp side, we are using task power library. On the F sharp side, we are using async. Now, you could ask yourself, what is the result of this code? So we are basically asking uh, for a task delay. Uh, we are basically calling task delay twice, but we are not awaiting for it straight away, right? We are first calling the methods, and then we are waiting on them one after another. Now, what would be execution time of uh, this function? Well, in practice, for .NET, uh, sorry, for C Sharp uh, task power library, it will be five seconds. For F Sharp async, it will be 10 seconds, but why? Well, the reason here is the difference between eager and lazy evaluation. In case of TPL, we have so-called eager evaluation. So we are starting the task and this task already started going. When we are awaiting it for it, we are only awaiting for its completion. In case of F sharp async, this await equivalent, so this do with bank, this is the point when the async is being called. What the async zip does is that it returns the async object, but async object is not any kind of handle. It's more like a description of action to be taken. It doesn't start any kind of work. It doesn't allocate any resources. It does so only when it's bound for execution. So when this do with bank option is being called. And it means that the same async, we could, uh, for F sharp kind uh, part, we could even uh, throw away this uh, let t2 equal async sleep and just uh, call do bank on the t1 twice. Because how it, the lazy computations work underneath is that whenever we are binding to async, uh, well, a lazy, a lazy uh, async in this case, this async creates some uh, special objects that uh, it's called activation, or, uh, async activation inside. And this async activation is actual handle to operation that is being run at this given moment. So binding twice to the same async creates two activations and each of them is actually executing the work. So each bind, in this case, each bind means calling sleep for five seconds, even if we call it on the same object. And well, this, is, this follows a philosophy of functional programming, which is lazy by default. And this is something I think is worth noticing if you want to be aware of this kind of weird behaviors that you might not expect. So I think that this, this difference uh, that we will be talking next, so stackless versus stackful coroutines, is the most profound one. So uh, let's start from talking about stackless coroutines. Uh, you can see here the example from, from before about doing those Excel spreadsheets, but this time we are using old Node.js API. 
very old. Uh, it was basically a callback base, so we were calling a function that can possibly complete asynchronously, and later on, it will execute the callback that we passed as uh, a parameter to it. So this was this pattern caused the infamous pyramid of doom of nested callbacks. So in the next version of JavaScript, they changed that into the promises. So instead of uh, wrapping everything inside of the callback, we created a promise that allows us to bind to it using this then function that you can see in beneath the return to assign this callback uh, later on. And this would create a new promise that later on can again be as, uh, assigned with the next callback using and then again and again and again and again. But this also is not so nice of, as having async await, right? So what, no, uh, so what JavaScript did basically is that we eventually turned those thens into awaits and our all mechanics have been wrapped in so-called async functions. Now, this is the popular approach, very popular approach. It's used in Dart, it's used in, of course, C Sharp, it's used in JavaScript and in many, many different, uh, and different languages. And all of them represent something that is called stackless coroutine. And so those promises, those tasks, those coroutines, they are not and the state that they have to keep in order to execute the next steps of the async await calls. And those steps, those variables are usually backed by some kind of the field that is generated into the state object killed by the coroutine itself. So these state objects li uh, live on the, on the heap. They are not stack based. They, they are living on the heap and we have then we have to eventually get rid of them by garbage collection process. There is also a problem of function coloring here. Uh, the issue here is that this is kind of popular. So the thing is that inside we, we can only call await from inside of method that is itself marked with async, right? We cannot call await in the synchronous methods. And this causes an API explosion because quite often, like for example in .NET, we have synchronous and asynchronous variants of the same function, of the same behavior, of the same operation. So another approach is called a stack of coroutine. And in this case, and this is the Lua program, because Lua have a stack of coroutines, it's probably most widely known in Go nowadays and the idea here is that when we are creating a routine here coroutine in Lua, go routine in Go, in .NET it would be some kind of concept higher, probably higher than the task themselves, we are assigning a stack to it. So whenever we call a function we create we create so-called a function activation frame which contains all of the variables, parameters, uh, return addresses that are used by this function when this function is called, being called, and when this function, fu function ends. So we know where in the code uh, should we return once this activation frames, once this function uh, ends. So how does it work in the case of coroutines? So we can imagine the code uh, that in code here we are calling it. So we have this main activation frame. Then we are creating a coroutine. This coroutine has its own stack. So later on, we are calling a foo method uh, inside of this coroutine. In, cor uh, in Lua coroutines, they are not run to completion automatically. We need to basically call every st step of their execution manually. So just you could imagine a coroutine being something like uh, I, A, I enumerable, for example. So you need to call move next manually in Lua in order to run it to completion. So here we call coroutine resume with some parameters uh, that are being passed to this full function. Then we are printing one of them. 
So we are adding activation frame of the print method, and then we are calling the bar, uh, bar method bar function. So later on, we are again printing it, and then we have this thing called coroutine yield. And yield works more or less like I enumerable yield fun uh, function gen generators, or as we could say await in, in .NET, in uh, C -sharp code, for example. The difference here is that there, you, know, you don't see any kind of async functions here, right? The yield is just an ordinary function. Just there is no difference in bool and uh, full methods. All of them, uh, both of them, uh, are exactly the same. Both of them are of the same color, we would say. So this yield uh, call can be executed from anywhere, really. And what this yield does is that it takes a coroutine stack and puts it aside and returns the execution pointer back to our main method and allows us to execute the next uh, next next call in this case print main and then when we want to resume our coroutine from being yielded we call a coroutine resume this time we don't need to pass any parameters because this uh, coroutine is already ex in the middle of execution and we can finally print the last uh, call and then and drop all the coroutine stack in there. So the question would be, what is the correct size stack for each coroutine? Because, um, well, we already mentioned that, for example, when we are creating threads in .NET, uh, what, it, what is happening there is that uh, each thread has one megabyte of uh, stack, right? But here, what is the correct uh, size? And in Golang, for example, there is no such thing. The stack size in Go routines can change. By default, it is, from what I remember, four kilobytes, but it can grow. For this reason, you have no stack overflow exceptions in Go, because if you would overflow the stack, the stack will be just expanded and resize it. So stackful Go routines exist uh, in Go. They're equivalent in Lua and soon in also in Java Loom project because Java as a late adopter decided not to introduce async await and instead uh, use the Go approach and back up the coroutines into the JVM itself. So if you remember the old days when we had to rewrite ha more than a half of a dot uh, using async, to use async code instead of synchronous one, in Java they decided that they won't do that and they will basically change it into sync, uh, well, it, and they will change the runtime itself to deal with that. So no rewrites will be needed. However, this doesn't mean that no profiling will be needed because this, of course, will affect programs, especially the fine-tuned ones. Well, we already mentioned that those Lua curtains are somewhere, somewhat familiar to I enumerables from .NET, and in fact, back in the times when Unity was restricted to C Sharp uh, 2.0, they already used those I enumerable uh, sequence generators in order to implement something that works like tasks on top of I enumerable uh, in Unity. We can go with it even further, one, further and for example, uh, integrate task parallel library with Linku. And in this example, you can see that the code on the left is basically extension method to tasks, with in, which implements select many, just like you would do in, in case of ordinary I enumerables. And with that, you can integrate the Linku syntax back into the TP, with TPL itself. So this from user in get user basically calls uh, tasks and I would say pulls out the result of that task into this user variable. So you can you could have composed uh, things like that in the past. The issue here is that this is expensive because we are allocating a lot of uh, closures here. Not only the task completion source, but also all of the lambda parameters that are necessary in here. And there are several of them for each of those calls. And this is expensive for this reason. Well. 
before we go further. And this is how many of the functional languages work today with their binding operators. They allow us to introduce something like, let's say, async await, use this kind of tricks. But C Sharp developers, uh, and I mean here C Sharp compiler developers, uh, thought that this is not sufficient and we can do it much, in much better way. So the idea here is that we introduce async await and we compile it by the compiler itself into so-called async uh, state machines. And this async state machine is basically a struct, stru uh, struct created by .NET compiler, which has field per every variable that is carried over uh, from one await step to another. And it contains also something that is called move next method, again, uh, analogy to I enumerable, and so-called uh, state, uh, state field, which basically says which of the await steps are we executing next. So going quickly here, we first create, a, when we are first calling our task foo, uh, our foo method, we are uh, initializing, creating and initializing this step uh, uh, state machine, starting it. Later on, we check the state, we see that it's minus one, so the state machine haven't yet started. We execute the first steps, so console write line, then we go to the task yield. This task yield returns an awaiter. Um, we save the state, uh, so we save at which step of the execution we, we are right now, and we subscribe to this awaiter in order to continue executing this move next method after it completes. And basically what it does, and uh, this is in the comments, is that it schedules the next uh, move next of this struct as a job on top of the thread pool. By default, this can be changed. So we return this function and uh, its execution, and later on when the task yield uh, completes, we call move next again. This time, we check the state, but it was changed for uh, in the last uh, call to zero, and we continue from there. And we call uh, the console write line for next time, and then we complete the our task. So this awaiter pattern can so this pattern was split into two really async state machine builders, so we can have our own async functions are returning our own. Uh, objects uh, which are equivalent to tasks and um, awaiter pattern so we can call await on the objects that we are going to use and this is the code that is minimum, minimum code necessary to implement awaiter and minimum code necessary to implement our own async functions well the body is not here but it wouldn't fit into the slides, sorry. Mm. Now, the thing here is that we used to think that those async calls are free, uh, but there aren't. Whenever we called async function, we need to initialize those state machines, uh, create the necessary fields, assign them, and call them. And it turns out that for small functions that we know that won't, for example, won't be executing asynchronously, the overhead of creating the state machine every single time can be quite big. And this is the tweet from Roger Johansson, one of the co-creators of Aka.net. Uh, when he, in the in his another project, which is called ProtoActor, when optimizing it, he basically removed the async uh, declarations in case when it was possible to execute uh, methods synchronously and just return them as value tasks. If it was not possible because, well, the value was not already there because, uh, for example, the underlying function was actually really executed uh, asynchronously, then it was uh, wrapped and you know, returned uh, using standard async await mechanism. But what he noticed is that he increased the throat of his applications from 47 million messages per second to 73 million messages per second just by removing all of those um, async state machine creations. 
and returning a pure value task when no state machine is needed. So keep that in mind. It's kind of micro, micro optimization, but it's worth having something like that on the back of your head in case if you are really into it. So summary. Uh, we talked about many different uh, ap approaches and trade-offs uh, when it comes to building user space threads. We also described how they are backed, or what they are backed by, and what they have all in common in this case, thread pools, which are lying founding ground for basically every one of those approaches that we discussed. For more, for those of you who are more interested about this. Uh, here are the references I can recommend. One of them is how to build your own async method builders. Another, how to build a custom affine thread pool from my blog, uh, from my blog if you are interested. What is the color of your function, uh, which describes this concept of uh, asynchronous functions and how do they pollute uh, the processing logic of our applications. Uh, the very nice uh, conference talk about how go scheduler work, if you are more interested about it. And uh, one blog post from Datadoc, which introduces a thread for core architecture written in, um, uh, actually a thread for core library written in Rust. And what awesome stuff you can do with it if you are also interested in Rust. So this will be it. And thank you for listening. Thank you, Bartosz. Uh, so uh, this was a this was quite a big overview of um, details, and uh, I didn't know about some implementation details uh, on GoLang, for instance. So thank you for that. Uh, the most um, the most interesting part of your talk, as for me, is uh, the ability to think about uh, different things across languages that do pretty much the same thing but differently. So I would like to speculate here a little bit. So you mentioned coroutines, which are not generally available in C Sharp language unless you're using Unity and uh, this e innumerable coroutine ish thing that you mentioned. While we have them in Lua or in Kotlin, uh, at the same time, we have uh, a similar mechanism, which is called computation expressions in F Sharp, which is not the same thing, but well, not, well, kind of. We can um, we can solve uh, similar problems using this mechanism. Uh, so when we talk about C sharp, as uh, Matt Sturgeson said in his uh, Queen Day uh, session last time, they don't want to introduce things that might be might be overcomplicated in C sharp. So when they decided to, to implement async await, their first uh, option was either they would like to implement async await only and try to make it as simple as possible, or they can go with go for something like uh, computation expression, uh, expressions, which is much more complicated and uh, which might, uh, well, not might, which, uh, which, which would need it uh, introducing concept of monads or something, which they don't want it to do because this would mean that C Sharp would not be a, ma a mainstream language anymore. You have to know, well, in a way, you know? Yeah. So what's your personal opinion on things like that? So maybe to uh, get closer into the source of this issue, the issue was not about the computation expression themselves. The issue was that at the beginning, async await only worked with tasks, right? Because uh, this, um, what we've seen is that those async await calls were desugared uh, by a C sharp compiler into those complex state machines. But the thing is that they were only operating on top of tasks and you couldn't create something of your own. In a sense, you still cannot because we call this, uh, in Sisha, we call this basically a duck typing. So we can, for example, integrate value task, tasks with tasks 
thanks to that, that the compiler knows that value tasks and tasks offer the same methods, right? Yeah. Because uh, both of them have the, implemented this awaiter pattern I was talking about. So we know that we can uh, await for them. And the issue about this functional programming features monads is that we would have to be able to express in C sharp type system itself this awaiter pattern, but it's not possible because, well, I would say that uh, that we would need to elevate generics in C sharp up to, well, actually generics in .NET up to the next dimension. Because, for example, you can uh, say that, for example you can call the select method on i enumerable, right? And have an i enumerable in return or i enumerable of t and have i enumerable of t in return. But you cannot say that you want to call a select uh, method on any type t that has a nested item of type, for example, t2 and return an, as a result something of type t that has nested type of T3, for example, because there is no way to describe this kind of relationship in .NET type system. And for this reason, we need to rely, in this case, on duct typing in awaiter pattern. Basically, C Sharp compiler can only check if those two types are implementing um, await methods, for example, right? So not await, but get awaiter, get result, and those on. And if they are implementing them, then it's okay, but you cannot uh, create an interface that is uh, basically describing, for example, get a waiter, get result, that returns a type that is the same type of, as in, implementer of this interface. And in some languages like Scala or Haskell, you can, but if you will try to do that, well, just like you mentioned, probably half of C Sharp developers will, would just give up because this is really like a mind twisting, twisting thing. And it would greatly increase the complexity of the solution. From what I think about this, this is uh, useful if you are willing to put an effort to understand that. So then this can be useful, but you know, we have working C Sharp programs and it looks like we are dealing with what we have, right? So we still have to rank complete programs that can solve basically any kind of issues. And well, it's better than trying to overcomplicate things just as Matt's mentioned. Yeah, I see a point. So as a C-sharp developer, if I'm not, if I'm not used to multi-threading uh, so much, but let's uh, let's say that I, I switched my current job and uh, my next job is really connected to multi-threading uh do i what's my best uh, uh, what's my best option do i need to continue using c sharp language or uh, maybe i might i might need to try f sharp or maybe i need to try golang or be, because everything that you've shown kind of makes sense but or erlang may be an option okay so to answer this question uh it really depends on your goals, right? Because some people uh, choose the career path that, for example, uses uh, their deep knowledge of .NET ecosystem, right? So and they are like .NET performance freaks. If Sorry, I didn't mind anything wrong by saying that, but uh, they are just super passionate about you know, optimizing their solutions in .NET, for example. Other people just want to focus on building applications. And from, for example, from my perspective, I love F Sharp for things like prototyping. And honestly, for most of the applications of small to medium size I've seen in my life, there is no reason not to use F Sharp other than people not knowing or not wanting to learn F Sharp. There is really no reason. F Sharp is great to write fast, understandable code. Uh, just It can be just as fast as C Sharp, as far as most of the line of business applications are concerned, really. There are some tweaks, because F Sharp is still higher level language, I would say, which is more abstract. So 
you know, there is a cost to abstraction that .NET Runtime cannot uh, erase for now at least. But it's not as significant as people would think about it. And really, I would just advise to try new things, like go out of, the, of your comfort zone, uh, try something new. Golang, for example, is a really simple language. You can, when I first tried to learn, uh, learn Golang, uh, it took me around two afternoons, really. So give it a try. Have fun and you know, try something new. This will also improve your skills as a C sharp developer simply because you will know you will see an inspiration of new approaches, of new designs, of new interfaces and solutions. Yeah, this totally makes sense. One musician one once told me that if you would like to be a better guitar player, uh, try learning dr playing drums because this <laughs> might improve your guitar sk guitar skills significantly. So I see Andrew here. Uh, it looks like we are running out of time, right? Yeah, exactly. So Bartosz, thank you very much for the amazing talk. It was pretty insightful. And currently I want to invite you and everyone who have any concurrency related question to the discussion zone uh, where you can continue your Q&A session and discuss any topics you, you would like.